Well, it's in Christ that, that, that we are reconciled to God. So Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Let me, let me read this for you. Perhaps you can look at it a little bit later. But now a righteousness from God, that's key. But we must be perfectly righteous to stand before God. And what the Bible is telling us is that the righteous that we, righteousness that we need comes from God, not ourselves. Righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. In other words, all of the Old Testament is looking forward to this righteousness. And it's been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Why? Because in his forbearance, in his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In other words, the very thing that Jesus is doing when he is nailed to that cross, when he is crucified, is he is making atonement for the sins of his people, or the sins of all who would believe on him. And God is in the cross proving himself to be just by punishing the sins of men. And at the same time, because the demands of his justice against sin are satisfied in Christ, proving himself to be just to display mercy to those who believe in him. It's Christ and his work on the cross that reconciles those things that perfectly displays God's love and, at the same time, his justice. Now, those who die in their sins, apart from believing on Christ, they will suffer God's punishment, his justice. They will suffer, they will endure, if it can be called endurance, his eternal wrath. Those who come to faith in God through Christ, believing that Christ's atonement reconciles them to God, well, they, they no longer know his condemnation. They no longer have to fear God in the way that, that Basam is sort of raising the question about. We fear God now as one who reverences a holy father. It's a familial fear. Why? Because Romans 8, chapter 1 says, Now therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The only rescue, the only shape, the only, the only escape, the only, the only shelter from God's wrath, from his condemnation, is to be found in Christ Jesus. It's to be found believing in him, worshiping him for who he is, God the Son, eternally God's Son, the one Savior of the world through whom all who would seek to enter into heaven must come. One difference, I think, between the Islamic conception of salvation and the Christian conception of salvation is what happens with regard to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not, when we as Christians speak of repentance and faith, saying merely that this is something that one can utter with their lips and then their lives are, are merely a matter of moral conformity to some outside law. Something far more wondrous happens, something supernatural. When the Christian talks about being saved, they're talking about a work of God on the heart of men, such that, in, in keeping with what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that man or woman or child who believes on Jesus is born again. They are made new. The psalm made references to the to the hearts of men in his talk. Jeremiah chapter 31 promises that God will make a covenant with his people, and in that covenant he will give them a new heart, and he will write on their heart his law. 
This is what happens to the person who turns to Christ in faith. They enter into a new covenant with God, and the spiritual experience of entering into that new covenant is nothing short, short of being born again, being made new, of having God, as it were, do a heart transplant and give you a clean heart. It's also what David prayed in Psalm 51. He confessed, my, my sins, my sins are against you and you only. And later he prays and asks, create in me a clean heart that he might worship him. That's what every man and woman needs, a clean heart. And the only prescription for it is believing in Christ, the Son of God, crucified, buried, and resurrected. And those who so believe live eternally in the fellowship of of God's love. They live eternally in the joy of his mercy and his presence. They live eternally to see God face to face following the day of judgment and seeing him according to David in Psalm 17, 15 will be satisfied. They will be rescued from their sins, rescued from self-righteousness, rescued from the uncertainty of will I ever know God and see him and enter fully and finally into his presence. One, one more thing and then I'll stop. This new birth, this being born again, as I said, it's not mere profession. It's a radical change. The outworking of that change is a new life. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10, there Paul says we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he goes on in verse 10, and he basically says this, that those who are so saved, they live a life of righteous good deeds. I agree with the song. Good deeds are, are, are accompanied to faith. But it's not faith plus good deeds that justify us before God, because Isaiah says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Not all of our sins are filthy before God. All of our righteous deeds are so imperfect, so tainted with sin, that our good acts condemn us before God. No, what justifies us before God is faith in Jesus alone and his righteousness. And where that faith is really present, it issues forth in a transformed life of obedience as worship to God. You know, it's striking, finally. Bassam made the point about God referring to himself in the pronoun me in the Old Testament. Striking that Jesus should say in John chapter 15, verses 14 and verse 21, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He inserts himself in the very place of God as the one who should be worshipped and that worship be expressed in love. And he inserts himself as the one who has entitlement to the commandments of God to enjoin them upon people and to call them to worship him and him alone. And who is God? There is but one God. His name is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He exists in three persons, though he is one being, each person fully God. And how are we saved? We're saved solely by the gracious work of God in agreement with his Son, who voluntarily came to take upon himself our sins and to be, a, to be a sacrifice of atonement for all who would believe upon him. And we are saved when God the Holy Spirit works in us a new heart, makes us new creatures, and seals us and preserves us by his own power until the day of God's redemption. I pray that we would all enter into that great salvation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tabiri. We will now take a break for five minutes, five minutes only. We ask that you only stand where you are seated to stretch if you'd like. We will start back again in five minutes exactly. <laughs>